Thank you, David. Welcome, everybody, and good morning. And this is really the first time that I'm that I'm I'm giving a talk in the future because it's already August 21st where you guys are, so that's really cool. Uh, anyway, I want to talk about the future too, and even beyond just one day. And I want to talk about what we work on here in the laboratory on virtual reality applications at CalIT2, and I want to uh, outline some of the projects that we work on and some of the hardware that we use, or the, the major hardware that we use to do our research. And I also want to point out that this laboratory is now about three years old, and we have had um, several dozens of students working with us. We always look for, for help on research projects, and we, we appreciate very much when somebody's interested in the work that we do and wants to collaborate on a project with us, or even perhaps come and uh, stay for a couple of months, as I hear is the is the uh, idea for this coming winter of ours here in your summer. So um, the overview of this talk, I'm first gonna the first part is going to talk about the hard is going to be about the hardware infrastructure here. We do 4K video in our auditorium. We have a large tile display wall, actually the largest tile display wall in the world. It's got more than a quarter billion pixels, and that's called the hyperspace. Then I'm going to talk about the sea wall, which is a virtual reality three-dimensional. Uh, it's a wall that can create three-dimensional pictures. Then I'm going to talk about the auto stereoscopic barrier and the latest virtual reality device that we have, that's the star cave. And then in the second part of the talk, I'm going to talk about the projects, the research projects that we work on that are all based on using this hardware and, and researching how it can best be used in, uh, to benefit various different application areas. And uh, such areas are digital cinema, structural engineering, uh, there's a camera project which is really on marine microbes, protein visualization is a topic, the uh, uh, arts, visualization in arts and and cultural themes is, is one topic. That's the CHISA 3 Institute related work. We have a collaboration with neuroscience and architecture. We do bio and medical visualization. We have this, uh, the students, uh, students in the prime project that work on projects with our lab here. And one of them is Sirvart. Is Sirvart there actually? I haven't, not able. Oh yeah, awesome. That's great. Oh yeah, now I, now I can recognize her. It's really hard on the lowest video that we're getting to recognize people. Um, then uh, I want to talk about projects that our undergraduate scholars have been working on this summer. And then I have a multimedia art project that's been quite successful that we've done here in the lab. And we have uh, our latest project that's going to go, it's a, it's a bigger effort that's going to take a while to complete is on 3D teleconferencing. So now to get started, I want to talk about these, uh, the hardware infrastructure that we use. And the first one I want to present is the 4K auditorium. So we have a 200 seat auditorium. You can see that here in this picture, you can see the people sitting there. And, um, and that's in, in the building that I'm in. It's the Cal IT2 building right here. That it's a very modern looking building with lots of glass and aluminum. And we have not only this 200-seat auditorium, which looks much like a movie theater, and it has a very large screen. It's uh, The screen is 32 by 18 feet, uh, approximately. It's very large. Oh, and, and, and that's, I should say, it's about 10 meters by, um, 10 meters by, it's probably 6, 10 by 6 meters. You guys use the metric system, I think, right? I appreciate that. Coming from Europe, Europe that's uh, a lot easier. I, don't really can't really identify with these American weird measures, but get get used to them, I guess. Um, so so this auditorium is very important to us because it's a way to show large groups of people what we do in our group on with research topics. And there's one topic is 4K video. 4K means I'm going to switch to the next. Uh, no, wait, that's that's later. 4K video is. Um, is four times the quality of the video that you're seeing now. Now you're seeing HD video, and uh, and we're going to have here we have 4K 
video which is 8 megapixel images at the rate of normal video, that's 24 or 30 frames per second. And we have different ways to do that. It's not easy to do as regular PC would be, uh, would be too, too small to even handle these large amounts of data. And I'm going to talk about these projects more. I'm going to just focus on the hardware right now. Then the other piece of hardware we use is a 3D stereo wall, which we call the C wall. And in this picture, you can see that I'm standing in front of this wall here, and I'm, I'm operating the system with a 3D handheld device, much like this, this clicker that I'm holding in my hand. Um, but it's a 3D device, so it's, I can actually point to things, and I can, can grab something and rotate it like this. It's a, it's a 3D device, even more so than the Wii remote, but it's, it's a lot like the Wii remote, in fact. Uh, so in this in this example here, I'm looking at a protein structure, and for me, with the uh, 3D glasses on, it actually looks like this protein comes out of the screen and is all around me. And uh, in this environment, we use this as an example. We use two PCs. We use passive stereo, which means that we have uh, 3D stereo with simple, relatively cheap uh, glasses that you might have used in an IMAX 3D theater or something like that. And these glasses can be distributed, since they're relatively inexpensive, they can be distributed to fairly large amounts of people. In front of this wall, we can fit about 15 people. Uh, in, a, in a bigger auditorium, we could even have used the same technology to do 3D for 200 people. And the, this device, this 3D device, is an Ascension flock of birds tracking system. And it's based on, magnetic, on a magnetic field. There's a magnetic field generator somewhere on the floor. And then you uh, have this device which consists of, um, of coils, of wires, and that can measure its position and orientation relative to that, to that transmitter that sits on the floor. And in our, in our setup here, we actually put the transmitter above the screen and hung it, up, hung it off the ceiling. Uh, the software we use in this environment and also in our other environments is called Covice. I'm just going to mention that. I'm not going to talk much about it. I'm going to talk about the applications more so than the software. The programming language we use is C++. For almost all our programming projects, all our research projects that require writing code. And APIs, for those of you who know a little bit about graphics, OpenGL is our the major graphics interface we use to, to create graphics. And there's OpenSceneGraph, which is a layer on top of OpenGL that's a library that allows you to write graphics code more easily, and, and it's kind of like if OpenGL was assembly language, then OpenSceneGraph would be like C++ or, or Java. And OpenAL is our audio layer. It's another library that we use to do, to do audio. We can also do audio in these environments. And this particular setup, which we had set up, uh, where we had sound set up out of four speakers around the user, we were using a library with which we were able to do spatialized sound out of these four speakers. Now in the cave, we have up to 10 channels of sound that we can separately address. Now the next kind of next bigger or um, uh, next more spectacular environment, perhaps, are these tiled display walls. We have multiple tiled display walls here in this building at CalIT2. Tiled display wall means that we put together a number of LCD panels in, in an array, a flat array typically, and mount them on a, on, on a mounting structure so that the, the screens are, are as close together as possible. You'll still see little boundaries around them. And in all these pictures, you can see these are different display walls set up in different places around the, the globe. Now, there's one in, at the University of Illinois in Chicago. Uh, and that one's here at, in the National Center for Microscopy at UCSD. There's one in, in Korea. Uh, one, here's one that was built in Amsterdam. And very soon, uh, so I hope, you guys are going to have one in, in David's lab. And that's going to be a 4x4 four four setup, much like, like this one, but with another row of screens. And Servart has been working on setting that up in the last couple of months. So these tile display walls, um, the feature, the main feature that they all share is that you get, by using all these LCD monitors, every monitor being capable of displaying about 2 million pixels, you can achieve displaying 30 million pixels or more 
depends on the size of the wall, maybe 100 million pixels up to 250 million pixels. And that would be the wall, uh, the biggest wall in the world, and that's here in this building. It's the hyperspace. We can do, or it's now it's 287 megapixels. So you can display lots of high resolution images. You might have a digital camera, and perhaps, you know, if you have a good one, it might be 10 megapixels or, or even more, 12, 15 megapixels. So imagine you can view one of these images on your screen so that you see both the whole image and all the pixels too. Otherwise, on your computer at home, you can, if you have a single monitor or perhaps two, you can always either zoom in and see every individual pixel in a certain area, or you can zoom out and look at the whole picture, but then you don't see the detail. So with these tile display walls, you can see all the pixels at once, and when you have a wall as big as the one in this picture, you can even bring up multiple of these images side by side and, for instance, compare them, compare the quality, compare the level of detail, and do studies like that. Or you can bring up pictures that are even bigger. And in this case, uh, that's a, a mosaic image that was, um, or these, these are actually several images, but this one up here is an image that was mosaic out of multiple pictures that were taken in panorama mode with a still camera. So that's something that you could even do at home. You could take your, your still camera overlap the pictures a bit and then use, there's free software out uh, online that can stitch these images together and then you can create a, a, a picture that's that's multiple uh, tens of megapixels in size so that it's really too big for your monitor at home. Um, now, here's an example for a tile display wall, an uh, inter interactive application on a tile display wall. Here you can see this wall and um, and here Iman, one of my students, is zooming into these cellular structures. And the idea in this project is, and here you can see him operate uh, with a 3D device that he holds in his hand, operate the system in front of the wall. And it's a 3D device, so you can actually grab things and move them around. And what you see there is a mitochondria. You can, you can grab every single sub-element of this mitochondria and, and drag it out and, and this is a tool to learn how these mitochondria look. Uh, it was created at the National Center for, Mi for Microscopy and Imaging Research here at UCSD. Just to show you an example for how you can use these walls. So you can either bring up large images, like I said before, or you can use these walls to use them interactively and use them as a big screen that's not just big but also has high resolution. Because keep in mind, these tile display walls, they're not, they're not there just to be big. That's just one feature. If you wanted a big screen, you could just take a projector like you guys do in, in the room you're in and, and blow up an image to the size of a tile display wall. And then you have uh, the same area covered with your image so that many people can see the image from a distance. But the trick really is these tile display walls have this high resolution so that you can't just see a big image, but you can also get close to the wall up to a distance that you would look at uh, from on the monitor, so that could be like 30 centimeters or 50 centimeters, and you'll still see you'll still see a lot of detail on the screen, as opposed to the screen that you guys are using there. When you get close, you don't see any more pixels than you see when you sit in, say, the front row. Now, the next uh, level, higher level of complexity for the kind of graphics that we do is the barrier wall. And the barrier wall, in this in this image, it looks much like one of those tile display walls that you've just seen in the other images. But in this case, this is a 3D wall. So the user here can see images in 3D. They, they pop out at the viewer. And that's without wearing stereo glasses. So now you might ask, how, this, how is this possible? And, and you might have seen this in, on these little postcards that have this, uh, uh, this lenticular lens structure on them. And when you, when you tilt them like that in front of you, you can see different images, kind of like a little animation out of two or three pictures. And the same technique can be used by putting these little lenses that are in front of the postcard, putting these lenses in front of LCD panels, and that's what we did here. Um, instead of lenses, we use we use a, a pattern of, of lines, black lines on a transparent background. And we put these these black lines on these on these LCD screens, and then we measure exactly where the viewer is and that allows us to focus the light into the viewer's eyes. And that's, that's fairly um, fascinating and, and it actually works. And the, the picture down here demonstrates how that works. There are the two eyes. They look at, this, at the screen. The screen is, 
is over at the left end of the picture. And I don't know how well you can see that uh, in your camera image, but there are the, the viewing rays are indicated here. And there's this, this dotted line which indicates the, the line structure that's, that's glued on, on top of these LCDs. And the, um, the line structure blocks certain pixels for every eye. And now by, by calculating which pixels each eye can see, you can display separate images for the left and the right eye um, so that the viewer can then, and by doing that, if you can separate the images out, you can display the images in 3D. And again, mind you, there's, there are no glasses involved. You can just see the image um, right in front of you. And we consider this the technology for 3D, the technology of the future, because you don't really want to wear these 3D glasses if you do, uh, if if you can if you can do otherwise. And that can be helpful in the office where you if you were sitting there with your 3D glasses all the time, and then you you have to look at you know maybe your laptop or a piece of paper, then you have to constantly take the glasses off and put them on again. That's just not very convenient. So that's the barrier wall. And it's driven by, um, just like the tile display walls, I should have added that, it's driven by a cluster of computers. These tile display walls are typically based on the on cluster technology. So every, every computer in the cluster, and in this case it's 15 computers driving 60 displays, so here every computer displays images on four of these LCDs. And that's that's about as many as you can as many monitors as you can drive with one machine. Typically, the ratio is more like one computer per two screens, or perhaps even one computer per screen for for more higher performance. And now the um, what we're the most proud of is the is the Star Cave virtual reality environment. The Star Cave is a one of a kind setup that that we have created last summer or actually set up last summer. We, have, we were working on it for almost two years before that towards the, the different components involved. The Star Cave is the closest that we have to the holodeck of the Star Trek TV show. And um, for those of you who know, the, the holo, what the holodeck is, is, it's this room that you go in, and then you're in this other, in this other world. Um, you, you're kind of almost beamed into that other environment but you're still physically in the holodeck, only that what you see around you is somewhere else, is an artificial virtual reality. And that we can do, what we cannot do yet is, the is first of all, we don't quite have the photorealism that the holodeck had, has. That's what we're still working on, and we're going to work on for several years to come. But we also don't have any haptic, haptic feedback. In the holodeck, in the actual one in Star Trek, you, you can touch things and you feel them, whereas in, in our Star Cave, it's all just virtual. So haptic feedback is another area of research that we would love to see advance more quickly than it is, and, and we would love to contribute more than we than we are. So um, now, what is the Star Cave? It's the Star Cave consists of five walls, and these walls you can see some of them down here. You can see four of these walls. They're they're about um, let's see, uh, they're four feet. Each screen here is four feet high, so that's about a meter and thirty centimeters. And three of them then would make it about four meters high. So we stack these three screens up in a way that the, the bottom ones are tilted in some, and the top ones are tilted in some in the same way. The middle ones are vertical. And then we have five of these walls around the viewer, the fifth of which is on wheels. And you can see that here. The fifth, fifth wall is, has been rolled out to the side. Um, and it can be rolled up to the cave if you want the full 360 degree experience. The Star Cave is driven by 15 computers for the, for the, for the screens uh, around the viewer, but we also project on the, on the floor, and that, that's two additional PCs that we used for the floor projection. The floor projection is done through the opening at the top, and there's a, there's a little catwalk, uh, which I don't know if you can see in the picture from where you guys are. It's a catwalk up at the top of the room that we put this all in. Um, and the room itself is is about 10, uh, it's about 8 meters high and 10 by 10 meters uh, in size. And the so there's a catwalk and there are four projectors mounted there that project onto the floor. So we have we have 360 degrees around and a floor. The only the only part that we don't project on is the ceiling because that's where the projector images come in. The computers we use are high-end gaming machines. They're Dell XPS 710s. 
uh, and in each of these gaming machines we have put two high-end NVIDIA Quadro 5600 graphics cards. These are these are very fast uh, graphics cards that those of you who like computer games would probably love to have because they're about the fastest that you can buy today. And uh, we use the operating system Linux to drive this whole setup like we do drive all our other tile display walls. And in fact, we also use the ROX software, which uh, is a cluster system that, that facilitates the use of Linux clusters. We use ROX in our cave, too. And then we use passive stereo, again, with glasses. So you, need, you do need glasses in the star cave. And you can use these passive stereo inexpensive glasses in it. Um, they use circular polarization. That's an important feature that when you go to a movie theater that has um, 3D, then you might have done this little test where when you when you look at the screen horizontally, you see the image in 3D, but when you tilt your head, um, the image gets screwed up. And if you tilted your head 90 degrees, then you would have switched the um, the eyes. And so uh, that's that's something that you cannot do in our cave because we use circular polarization where it doesn't matter from wh what orientation you look at the screens, it's always correct stereo. And why do we do that? That's because we project on the floor and when you turn around and you want to see the image on the floor, there's no specific direction out of which you would look at the floor. So we, it has to be uh, direction independent. And the, the tracking itself is done by optical by optical tracking. At the top of these, these walls are four cameras. They're really just infrared cameras. And they take a picture of what happens inside the cave. And the, uh, the hardware that we use to interact with everything is, has these little silver balls attached to them. The silver balls reflect the infrared light that comes from the cameras. They have infrared light bulbs around them um, to illuminate the scene. That infrared light goes back into the cameras, and then they can see where all these little silver balls are. And that works much like motion capturing. If, you've, if you have uh, paid attention to how they create these visual effects in movies today, they often put these, these suits on with lots of little uh, markers on them. And then they, they, um, then people get filmed, and the markers then get used to be the basis for the for moving and animating a skeleton of, of perhaps some some uh, some dragon or something like that in the movie. So um, so that's the sa similar very similar technology, only that we we control uh, the joystick positioning and and the user's position where the user is themselves is with these markers. All right, so as you can probably imagine, when once you have a nice visualization center, then you get to do a lot of tours and demos, and and we have at least one demo per day. One could say sometimes up to five or six, and in this picture, just to show you uh, that it can be a lot of fun, we had a, uh, an elementary school class that came to our lab, and we showed them 3D graphics, and they would try to touch things, and and they were they were very fascinated just by the technology really not necessarily even by the content the content didn't matter to them and so it's it's a very fun topic to work with visualization is very fun because whatever you do you see the result on the screen immediately and that's because that's the purpose of what you do all right now i want to talk about the research projects and i want to mention a few projects in more detail and then and then other projects uh, a little bit briefer so the first one I want to talk about is 4K movie research. This is using, for instance, the auditorium with the 4K projector. 4K means 4,096 pixels horizontally across the image. And then vertically, there's depends on, on what hardware you use. It can be from between anywhere between 2160, that's the twice the resolution that HD has, uh, to 2400 pixels, which would be a different aspect ratio. The pixels are always, always square, so you can you can use different aspect ratios and therefore display existing movies that have a certain aspect ratio. That's the the, the fraction between width and height of the image. Um, so you have a have a greater room to play with those different uh, materials, source materials. The typical size is about eight megapixels per frame. Could be up to nine or a little bit more. The, the these are so these are every frame of these movies is the resolution of a fairly good digital camera. And if you have if you have a camera that can take eight megapixel images, then you might have experienced loading them into say Photoshop 
takes a few seconds. Scrolling around on the image is, is very painful, zooming in and all. Everything, depending on how fast your computer is, obviously, but everything takes a little while. It's not very fun to work with hundreds of these images. Now, when it comes to 4K movies, we do have to work with hundreds of these images, but not only hundreds, but thousands, tens of thousands. Because every second of the movie, every second of the movie, if it's 24 frames per second, which is the typical standard movie rate, 24 frames per second, that means 24 of these 8 megapixel images per second. And that needs to be processed by the whole pipeline. And the pipeline is from the source where we load the data, and that can be a hard disk, or it can be a remote site. Like, say, if we were doing this in 4K today, then we'd have to stream four times the amount of data to you guys. And that would be even more than we can possibly handle with the, the network connection that we, we currently have in place. Or we do, or the other way is to compress it down more, but then the quality uh, is lost again. So it's it's a lot of data. It's in fact about seven, about 600 megabytes, megabytes per second, 600 megabytes per second. So that's the content of a CD-ROM every second, and we have to transfer that. And that's uncompressed. If we do uncompressed 4K, that has to be loaded from the hard disk. It has to go into the main memory. Has to go somehow to the graphics card, and along the way there cannot be a noticeable delay because otherwise um, you can't do tele televideo like we're doing it now. Uh, so, so this is, it's very hardware intensive. And therefore, because it is this way, it's not only hardware intensive to load the data, but also to store it. Imagine you have 600 megabytes per second. Now multiply that by the duration of a, of a feature movie say, an hour and a half, and you get huge amounts of data in the terabyte range. So what we have for this project is, for instance, a 48 terabyte, 48 terabyte file server, which consists of multiple disks, so that you can load, you can you store part of every image. Like, this monitor image was one of them. You could just divide it into several uh, subsections and then store every subsection on one disk so that you can parallelize the loading and load every part from a different disk that allows you to load a lot of data, and that's just one of the optimizations that we deal with. Now, in order to get this all more organized, there's this Cinegrid um, a group that's a nonprofit organization where many Hollywood filmmakers and especially post-production houses are members, and so are we, and we're fairly active in the Cinegrid community to push this 4K resolution uh, and also full, fully digital workflows using 4K images forward so that in the future when we go to the movie theater we can actually see 4K movies. And I can tell you, I've, I'm so spoiled by our 4K theater that when I go to, the, to a regular movie theater, even if it's a digital one, I always see the, the, the fuzziness and the size of the image is usually smaller. I'm completely spoiled. I really wish that everyone had these 4K theaters and I can't wait for more of them to emerge but having and there are also there are already several movie theaters that have these projectors, but they don't have the rest of the technology to be able to actually stream or, or display movies at this resolution. And the movies don't even exist. The creating the material is hard because it, it's so computer compute intensive, storage intensive. There are only very few cameras out there that you can use to make a movie in 4K. Otherwise, you scan existing analog film in 4K format, which works. So it's, it's, a, it's a very complex topic, and it's very fun to work in, on it. And the, the Cinegrid Exchange, because it's on the slide, um, that's, that's our, our mechanism to store and, and serve these terabytes of 4K video. And then not to forget the audio. We also have multi-channel audio. Typically, it's about 8 channels, 7.1 uh, for normal movie production, but we can we can play back up to 24 channel in our in our auditorium. Here's an example for how you can do 4K, use 4K technology for telepresence. In this picture here, you can see in the foreground these people down at the bottom are in the local auditorium in our in our lab, and the uh, the three uh, gentlemen here at the top are at Keio University in Japan, and they were 4K telepresenced in to this to this. Uh, uh, for this experiment at a Cinegrid uh, conference, and it was amazing how detailed you were able to see the 
these people and and it was just like that having them there much like like I talk to you now but at higher resolution with multiple people and on a much larger screen and to enable this technology we use these 10 gigabit networks 10 gigabit networks means we can transfer 10 gigabit per second over these networks that's more than one gigabyte per second so but when you when you compare that now to the 600 megabytes per second we need for 4k video you can see that the 600 megabytes are very close to the limit of what these networks can do even though they're 10 times faster than than uh, the one gigabit networks that you might have between your your computer at work and um, and the the switch in the office or in the lab if you have if you work in the lab somewhere so these are very fast networks and they're they're only they're not for the mainstream yet they're they're only for research purposes and this is the network in the US and it also goes to many other countries and I believe that there's also a link to uh, your university but but I'm not quite up to date on that now I want to talk about uh, a few virtual reality projects so enough of 4k this is the first project I want to mention it's a because it has a nice story and we we followed through from the beginning to the end and it's it's already completed the project at least to some point this is a collaboration as it typically happens the structural engineering department approached us because they were part of the 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 uh, architectural phase of uh, building a new bridge going from San Francisco to Oakland in the Bay Area there's already a bridge there but it's not earthquake safe um, they figured after like 30 years or something like that so now they're building another bridge right next to it that's that's built with more modern technology so one of these the parts of this bridge is this huge um, this huge part here which is about 30 meters by 20 meters by 10 meters in size and it's it was assembled in Corpus Christi in Texas and then shipped and you can see that here it's on the ship uh, through the Panama Canal to San Francisco so it's a huge part and this is the foundation of a tower and part of the bridge is suspended off of this tower and um, the tower needs to be the footing needs to be submerged in the water there and it needs to hold the rest of the tower and so on the top of the of that piece there are lots of of parts that have to fit into the next part over that that then gets put on this foundation so this all was installed in in reality in in the in the bay last year um, but we got the data of this tower so we worked with the architects that created a CAD model a computer-aided design model in their computers before they even built the part and then they built it and then after the fact we got the CAD model and then put it up in our virtual reality environment so here you can see uh, here you can see this this bridge part and you can see the metal structures the the beams that go through it and that that form the the stability that make for the stability of the part and it's then filled eventually with concrete but by using CAD you can kind of peel off the different layers of the of these these engineering parts and here we go inside a part and here you can see what we've what we've done for a research project we were trying to find out what can we do with this CAD data in 3D when we can see it at the real size and one thing is we can zoom in close to to, uh, to places like here where two of these beams they intersect and they're not supposed to they, they can't in reality because they're solid so this is a CAD uh, kind of like a bug in a, if it was computer code it's, a, it's an error and uh, you can in reality what they do when they find these errors they'll they'll try to bend out some of the some of these beams out somewhat so that they can make room for it but sometimes there are errors that they can't easily be fixed on the construction site and then it can happen that the whole construction site then has to come to a standstill for say a day and if that happens then that can cost millions of dollars so this technology can potentially help save millions of dollars which also means that the, since the technology is expensive um, that it can recover its cost very quickly even if they just find one of these one of these errors on the in the construction site and and the, the VR technology virtual reality technology can potentially be put in a container that can then be uh, delivered to the construction site and then move around there very easily because it could all be inside this container like an office like a little little movable office and the engineers could then get together and 
and use the technology to figure out what to do with in case of problems like this. And another reason for why to do this in virtual reality is to be able to see these parts before they're even built, see them life size. So you can see if the workers can actually get in there and get take their equipment with them. And then once they've assembled all these these beams, can they even get out afterwards or have they then locked themselves in there? So that's something that you can really only do by building a virtual model or a real model where you can test uh, to see whether people can work in these in these tight spaces. Here's another project. Now I'm switching uh, to um, a biological project. This is called the Camera Project. It's about the diversity of DNA in our oceans. And it's actually quite interesting because the oceans are expected to have more diverse DNA than than all the the animals and plants on land, including the, the, the humans. And uh, so for to, to study these oceans and to study the DNA and the, the rich amount of information uh, that's in this in this DNA, Craig Venter, who is one of the people who headed the one of the two human genome projects several years ago, he traveled around the world on his sailboat and took samples at 200 locations, took water samples at various depths. And then these water samples got sent to the lab, and then in the lab they were sequenced, the microbes that were in there, the DNA of those microbes was sequenced, and then put in a large data bank. The data bank is now housed here at San, in San Diego at the Supercomputing Center. And in this project, um, we went ahead and visualized parts of this data. One, one project was to take the data and look at where these samples were taken. What was the, the what was the temperature of the water? What was the the location of the, the point, the place that the water sample was taken? How deep was it taken in the water? And then also, what's the what's the habitat? Is it is it in the in the middle of the ocean or is it a coastal area? So there are all these different parameters for every water sample. And oftentimes, when researchers find a microbe, say they find a microbe in this data bank that has DNA that looks very much like cancer DNA, then perhaps that can be the start for a project that helps find a cure for this kind of cancer, right? Because maybe the microbes have figured that out millions of years ago, and the solution is just waiting down in the ocean. So that's one of the premises that was uh, that were taken for this project. So with this application, we can visualize the Earth in 3D, and we can we can visualize the data with various methods uh, on the Earth. So that's much like using Google Earth, but only in our 3D spaces where you have a bigger screen, more detail, more pixels to display the data. And this is a project that an undergraduate student did in her second year. So she was a, a sophomore when she did this project. It had almost no programming background. Uh, was, wasn't even from computer science, and she did an, a phenomenal job learning the C++ language and figuring out how these systems work, and then came up with, uh, created this application that actually runs in our cave system, and did all this over the course of three months in the summer. And that's much the, much like the time period that, that some of you are going to go here in your summer in about a half a year. So for those of you who are interested in doing that, these kinds of projects can be done in these time frames even if you don't have a whole lot of programming knowledge. It's better to have more of a background in programming, but even if you're, if you're very enthusiastic uh, and you're a fast learner, then, then you can still give it a try, and it can, it can well work out. Uh, this is another project that we have done, and this project also started with an undergraduate researcher that worked on it. It's about protein visualizations. It's related to these microbes. When you go one level higher in the data, or you could call it lower, you look at, instead of the, the sample locations, you look at the actual samples and the DNA. And the DNA encodes amino acids, and these amino acids then encode protein structures. So here we visualize these protein structures, and you can then see a protein bigger than, than, than yourself, and that helps the researchers, because these protein structures are very complex. They're very complex three-dimensional structures. It helps the researchers learn more about the function of these proteins, how they work. And in this example, uh, we even have a connection to, to an internet program where there's more information about the protein. So we can bring text into these virtual environments, and we have a windowing system 
that's that's actually very nice to have. So you can you can write applications that use textual information, much like on the desktop in a Windows or or a Mac environment, and use the same kind of window metaphor in your in the Star Cave or on any of these systems that I talked about before. That can be tile display walls or the barrier or 3D walls or you name it. Here's another example for a research project. Uh, this is archaeology. We have a professor here, that's Professor Levy, who travels to Jordan about once a year to lead uh, an excavation team. So he'll go there and, and dig up ancient buildings uh, from the biblical age. And in this case, he found this, this building structure and he, he carbon dated the, the layers of slag that were accumulated at the time by making by creating metal and uh, and these are the byproducts of it um, and he carbon dated these these layers and found out that contrary to what they believed before they were they were older than it was believed before so he kind of rewrote a small part of the history of this of this area so these kinds of things can also be used successfully for visualization because here we brought in this this whole uh, excavation site into the virtual environment where it's a lot easier to see where these carbon dating sites were in the three-dimensional context of the of the excavation site because in when you excavate something it's like peeling off layer by layer of the ground and then finding something so you'll find an artifact and then you you dig more and you find another artifact so there it's a, it's a true three-dimensional space that you deal with and it's not only three-dimensional it's also time the, d the deeper you dig the more you go back in time. So you have this sort of four-dimensional space of data. And then to visualize it, these 3D environments are very well suited. Here's another area, uh, multispectral art. So here you can see an artwork by Da Vinci, Leonardo Da Vinci. This is the this is the part of the adoration of the Magi. It's an old painting that's very large in fact it's it's about uh, two meters by two meters in size and it lo it's located in Italy in Florence the original we have a high resolution scan it's a 400 megapixel image and we don't only have one scan of it we also have that we ha have multiple um, versions of the same image taken under different lighting conditions so the, the first version would be visual light. We just took regular light, a regular camera. And then another one is infrared light, where we, show, where we had infrared light shining on the, on the painting and then using an infrared camera to take the pictures. So that's another way to look kind of through the paint. And then by doing that, you can find out what's below the, the paint layer. And you can sometimes you can reveal the original sketch that was done with charcoal on the canvas, and that's that's fairly amazing, and that can be visualized very well on these tile display walls at high resolution or multi. These are this is a, the setup, the seawall setup with two projectors, four megapixels. Uh, that's another project that can be done, uh, where I had a student working on this over a summer, undergraduate, and he made tremendous progress over that summer, so that it turned into an application now that we use on a regular basis. Another example, the Cal IT2 building model. This is a virtual version of the Cal IT2 building, the building we're in. Uh, there's a student that has undergraduate, again, sophomore, who's been working on this over this summer. And from starting with a model of it that had only the first floor in it, she added the other floors and she added the elevators and the stairs and a lot more detail, all within just eight or nine weeks. This building model is now used in another project, in a project with the neuroscience department, where we run a study which tries to find out how people navigate through unknown spaces. So we use the building and then uh, go to the cave environment, to the star cave, and, and take a subject who we put this cap on. That there's a, there's, this is like a, a swimming cap. And on the cap are about 250 electrodes that are mounted in different places that capture the brain activity, brain waves. And by doing that, by measuring the brain activity, we can distinguish whether the person is in a space where they know where they are. That's the case when the signage is good or when you can see through windows where you are at. 
and compare that to a place where you don't know where you are. And many of you might have been perhaps visiting someone at a hospital, and that happened to me. I visited a friend in the hospital, and I was looking for their room and, and couldn't quite find it. Went, took the elevator, went up. Everything looks the same. All the corridors look the same. The only thing you can rely on are the numbers, the, the signage that, that tells you the room number, but that's really it. Now, it even happens to me here in the building that I work in that many of the floors look alike. So I'll go, I'll try to go to the fifth floor, take the elevator. Someone else gets off on the third floor. I don't think about it, get off as well, and only notice that I got off on the wrong floor, like when I've already walked out the elevator and noticed something that's different than on the fifth floor. So there's there's this this research research in neuroscience that tries to find out when someone actually knows their way or when they don't. And it's useful because you can use this research the results to make these kinds of public spaces like hospitals or other public spaces more navigatable so that when you go in there you and especially once you found your way once that you can then find it again and that can be done by landmarks or signage or colors and and no one really knows how much either of these elements contribute to the wayfinding capability of people and what what various strengths people have some people are easier have an easier time reading signs the others others are, have an easier time memorizing landmarks. So it's a, it's a very interesting project. Here's a, another project, biological volume rendering. Here we look at confocal image stacks. Um, that's a project that has connections, uh, but more of the remote sort to what Servart has been working on in the summer. There's a confocal microscope in, uh, in your guys' institute there that captures these high-resolution images. It can it can, and confocal microscope means it's a microscope that can show you the content, the inside of a cell. So it captures these images at high resolution, and then the biologists want to see what's what's on the image. And one way to display all that detail is to bring up that image on a tiled display wall, so you can see all the pixels of the image without having to zoom and pan around on the image. So that's one thing that these tiled display walls can be used for. Uh, we can use the same technology in medical volume rendering. Medical means medical data sets. These are CAT scans. Volume rendering means we render the volume as opposed to the surface of something, which means you can look into things. If you have a stack of CAT images, then you can stack them up into a 3D shape and then look at things in 3D. This is a collaboration with the Children's Hospital here in San Diego, where uh, doctors um, have to fix all kinds of uh, uh, structural defects here, for instance, one with the spine. And we do collaborative applications where we can have either multiple people in the same virtual environment, like a cave, or we can do remote collaboration. And in this picture here, you can see there's there's a person looking at the whole thing. That's the, the local user. And then you can see one. You can kind of see a person here. There's glasses, and there's there's a hand, and there's there's an indicator for where the feet are. You can see the same thing on the other side. So there are three locations here. They are um, in different places of the world, and they can all work with the same data set. And that's something that we can do between here, for instance, and the wall that David's going to have. Uh, this is a project that an undergraduate, and now I'm nearing the end. I just have uh, just one more slide. This is the this is the uh, uh, tracking project. So here we try to replace the tracking system that we use in the cave today with these infrared cameras and, and markers, which costs about $60,000. It's very expensive. It's a significant part of the cost for these virtual environments is the tracking. We, we try to replace that with a Wii controller based system. So we bought these four Wii controllers, mount three of them on a tiled display wall, and use the fourth to control the system. So that's a project that an undergraduate researcher is working on this summer. That's, again, the kind of project that someone from your group might work on if they decided to come to our lab in, the, in your summer. And, um, oh, there's, there's one more. So this is, this is the art project. This is called Atlas in Silico. is a project where we visualize data in an artful way. This is scientific data from this camera project where the marine microbes were sampled and here you can see the data from the camera project in an, in an artful installation. We had that at SIGGRAPH last year in San Diego, and, and now just recently it was on display in Cleveland. So there you can see if you work on a project like this, that you're 
work can survive uh, way beyond your own stay and it could be displayed uh, around the world at various times in the future. And this is the last slide on 3D teleconferencing. This is the, uh, the latest project that I've been working on. I have two students in the, in the prime project right now, one in Osaka and one in uh, Taiwan. They're working on 3D teleconferencing, which means what we do right now is teleconferencing in 2D. I, I am a 3D person, and you guys are 3D, but what we see of each other is a flat image. Now, in 3D teleconferencing, what you see is an actual three-dimensional image of the other person or group, and that can be done today with large amounts of video cameras that film the entire uh, group of people that interact and then recreate that, send that information over the over a fast network, and then recreate the information at the destination. That can look like this, where these two people here um, are put in, in front of a, a background, a computer uh, a rendered background, so that you can display people in a completely different context. Or it has a lot of other uses too. You can, you could, for instance, uh, teach dance moves. Whoever's tried that before might know that it's very hard, but if you could move the camera around and look and zoom in on the feet, then that would be a lot easier. So the, um, the limit is really just the imagination. All right, well, thank you very much, and I'm going to take questions, and if you uh, want to have more information about these research projects and the work in my lab, you can go to my, uh, to my own personal page, that's this one, or in the second line, that's the lab page. There's information on many of the projects that I've just shown you, or you can send me email if you want more information. So thank you very much, and now I'm taking questions.